Okay, see objectives of this session. So I was already discussing that uh, the objective of this three hour session that would be exploring the SOA and the non SOA world. We'll try to understand the SOA world and its offerings. We'll, we'll understand taking few examples into consideration that what a particular example looks before SOA and after SOA and probably then we would be able to identify what are the key differences between these both. Then we'll move ahead by learning the best SOA best practices because uh, if you want to implement any application or any solution with SOA then probably the first thing that you would want to know is the SOA best practices. Understand with and without SOA. So this will be an extension of SOA best practices and understand before and after SOA. Right. And later on we'll try to club all the concepts like SOA, middleware and web services. Probably all these terms are very commonly used and related to each other. So we'll, we'll try to cover all of these terminologies and all these jargons all together and try to understand all of them. Okay, so business challenges and IT aids. Be it any project that we do or any organization doing any project, right? There is always a business intent for any project that we do, right? Let's say all of us are here to attend a session which is actually a project for all of us, right? So before actually understanding what SOA is and what it is all about and where it actually helps in the system architects or the project managers or the developers or the people who actually do the business strategy, right? So before actually understanding SOA and the SOA needs, Let's try to understand what are the business challenges and IT aids which are available, right? So if you, if you just, if I just walk through you with this presentation, the slide, it says what are the problem statements that which are most common these days. So if you see the block which I'm trying to highlight here is, you, you see the sustainability. acquisition, time to market, agility to business and IT changes, lost business, make versus buy, stringent, contingent and fallback reserves, cost overruns. So these are different kind of problems or challenges under different categories. These challenges could be the technological challenges or the return on the investment kind of a challenges, right. And all organizations face these challenges, right. So going ahead, what do we do in order to tackle these challenges, right. The very most important challenge which I found and I want to highlight is the stringent contingency and fallback reserve challenge and the IT and business features. So if you can see the IT and business features are being the root cause of this problem is actually the duplicated efforts, right. So we all know that duplicated efforts lead to project cost overrun, project time overrun and different challenges, right. Now going ahead, what do we do for these problems? There are too many connecting lines. So there are actually too many uh, so this lines in terms of the IT convention or the, uh, I would like to rephrase this line in terms of there are too many interactions, right, there are too many calls and this too many interactions are or can be stated as point to point in interactions or point to point integrations. What is point to point integration, what, what I mean by when I say point to point integration? Every system is trying to connect to every other system, right. So the communication channels, let's say if I have 15 systems or 20 systems here in this entire ecosystem, each system is trying to interact with all of the other systems, which is not good, right. 
which is not as for the latest frameworks and latest technology that we have these days, right? So and so when we say we have a lot of interactions and so these interactions is actually the complex architecture. This complex, so the, all these interactions is actually making this architecture complex, right? But if we if we go back and see some of the pitfalls which I have tried to highlight it here is non-agility and appropriateness. I will just try to give you a detailed, uh, let me just walk through, read, read these options out for you. Scalability and performance, security and timelines and data protection, accuracy and timelines, availability and recoverability, right. So when I say non-agility and appro uh, appropriateness, performance, scalability, timelines, accuracy, recoverability. So the reason of all these pitfalls here is, is that it's, it's very cohesive and very tightly coupled system. So when I say that there are too many interactions happening, that means the system is very cohesive and very tightly coupled. And if you have any system which is very tightly coupled and very cohesive, you have the problem of agility, you have the problem of scalability, performance. Again, causes are already discussed because you have so many point to point integrations. We have the spoken hub architecture. We'll discuss, we have a couple of slides later on where we'll discuss what is spoken hub architecture. Single responsibility principle. Again, we already discussed that it is the single responsibility principle and tightly coupled nature of the architecture which is actually making it too much of tightly coupled. Coarse grained implementation. This is quite interesting. So any one of you knows about what is coarse grained in, uh, implementation, what is fine grained? Probably if any one of you would like to reply back to me. Uh, I will not wait for too long here. Uh, probably I have to move on. I will just wait for your answer if uh, any one of you knows about it. So coarse grain implementation is actually the very drill down implementation in a sense that every every entity is dependent on the other entity very on a large scale, right? They are tightly coupled. So this makes the implementation coarse grained. All these problems will actually lead to single point of failure. There is no scope of scalability and performance. You have lost of cost overruns. You will have lot of cost overruns for the reason that for any change that you want to do in the system, will require a lot of time, right? And time will eventually lead to spending more money, right? And what is the final impact that you get? That the return on investment gets lower, right? This is more on the business side context that because you are spending too much of time in building the system or making changes to the existing system. So the overall purpose, the business purpose, of the system goes down because your revenues are getting infected. So service architecture is a collection of related and non-related services classified into types, arranged into layers. So you can have a presentation, business, FACAR, DAO, mediation. So you can create a service at any layer, right? And any service architecture is actually governed by patterns and policies. So based on security, discoverability, etc. So We'll, we'll just move on and we have all the detailed slides going forward. So just to let you know guys, we have uh, around 95 plus slides here and probably all of the content which we are uh, trying to discuss, all the content will be discussed in detail. Okay. So what, what are the non sewer word challenges? So I'll just re reiterate here. So non sewer word challenges is the loss of agility, again, exponential increase in complexity, single point of failure, no course of action for emergencies.
Now, what what do we mean by in exponential increase in complexity? So the in exponential increase in complexity I was stating earlier is actually very directly proportional to the point to point connections that we need to integrate with the number of components. The more and more number of point to point connections that you have, the more complexity that would be built into the system. Additionally, if you try to add new components, right, adding of any new component will eventually also lead to lot of complexity because you have to make that component integrate again with different different components which are already there in the system. Right? Now single point of failure. As we all know any enterprise solution that we have, right, any banking system, any telecom system, right, any retail system, any solution architect cannot afford to have a single point of failure for that system. Let's say a particular node or a particular server, a particular cluster goes down. So it should not, the system should not be designed in a way that the entire system goes down, right. It could, it could only be a part of the system that could go down or the system should be deployed in such a fashion, in a such a environment so that if one of the component, if one of the clusters or one of the instances of the system goes down, the other system takes up. Uh, guys, let me complete a couple of slides then I'll just get, get back to your questions. Okay, again, uh, no course of action for emergencies. So as we all know, it is a very cohesive and well co tightly coupled application. So no system integrator or solution or architect would be able to give you an immediate solution, right? So I, I'm on this slide. Loss of agility. So loss of agility is again like point to point integration architecture again is the reason for the tightly coupled connections and your system should is not agile, the system is not adaptable to any new changes in the system rapidly. That is the reason why your system becomes non-agile. Okay, now we have already discussed couple of problems in a complex architecture which is a non so architecture. Then what is the need of SOA, right? So the answer is all, so by looking at the complexities, the problems of the non SOA world, whatever the non SOA world problems, they all, the, the need for SOA is actually the problems that we have in the non SOA world, right? So the need for SOA is that the SOA process or a SOA application would be agile, it will give you an agility, it will give you a reusability which is very important, right? And we will take some very good examples from usability standpoint later on in the slide. Development efficiency which is very important, right? And ease of maintenance. So if you take the three examples, development, efficiency, reusability and ease of maintenance. That they are all pro probably correlate to each other. If I have a component, if I have something which I can reuse in my application, then probably my development efficiency will go up, right? And if my development efficiency will go up and I have reusable components, then probably my ease of maintenance will go up, right? And when my ease of maintenance will go up, then probably my agility will go up, right? And when my agility will go up, then probably the system would be considered to be more standardized with more process oriented, right? And if I summarize everything, if I have a system which is more agile, which, is, which has more development efficiency, which has, which has a standardized way of executing things, then I can say the system is more flexible. I'll move on to the next slide. 
so these are some important terminology or facets about SUA. Let's try to understand SUA from what uh, different communities say about SUA. Right. SUA is an architectural style for building software applications that uses services available in networks such as the web. It promotes loose coupling between software components so that they can be reused. Applications in SUA are built on services. We've already gone through a site where we were already discussing what is a service, right? A service is an implementation of well-defined business functionality and such services can then be consumed by clients in different applications or business processes. SUA allows for the reuse of existing assets where new services can be created from an existing IT infrastructure of systems. So I have loads of examples in the following slides which would be talking about the reusability, how it is done, taking some uh, IT applications examples or business problem statements as an example. So we will have so many slides later on to actually see all these details and have a very good feeling about that. In other words, it enables businesses to leverage existing investments by allowing them to use, reuse existing applications and promises interoperability between heterogeneous applications and technologies. Right. Now I go to the next slide, which is slide number 12, SOA representation. So now this slide is actually a detailed slide which will give a very good overview of how a SOA representation or a SOA implementation looks like. So considering this slide, we have tried to incorporate all the aspects of SOA, right? What is the operational layer? Let's say you have a telecom solution, right? Or you have a core banking system solution. Or let's say you have a retail banking solution, right? So operation by operational layer, what I mean, there would be few components or you have a SAP application running in background. So there would be an R layer which would be directly communicating with these systems. Let's take an example, you have a Java solution which is a legacy solution, right? So this Java solution is actually interacting with all the databases that you have, is interacting with the different billing systems, provisioning systems, revenue systems, right? So the example for this operation layer is actually an adapter, right? So in SOA terminology, we actually create some adapters to interact with these backend systems or uh, third party systems. Then you have the middle, middleware layer or the EI layer. EI is the enterprise application integration layer. So I've tried to include couple of examples like these are the most common widely used middleware products which are being used in huge enterprise solutions. So TIPCO is one of them, BA WebLogic has another middleware solution, Oracle Fusion, web methods is very predominantly used, right. Now you have the enterprise service layer. Enterprise service layer is actually the layer which the architect team would be designing and de deploying their services. So in any SOA representation or any SOA solutions, whatever that we, we actually encapsulate all our businesses with the help of our services, right? So enterprise service layer comes into that picture. Now, let's say you have a process, you have a loan, apply system. Any end user wants to apply for a loan, right? Now you expose some services for a loan acquisition system or loan credit ranking system or loan processing system. So you will be exposing some services. Now on top of the enterprise service layer you have the service orchestration layer or VPM is the business process monitoring. So what this service orchestration layer will do that a service may be available, but if that service is not being exposed to the clients, right, 
the service will remain unused, right? The service will have no significance. So the service should be discoverable, right? This, a client should know what the service does, how it works, what the client should send to the service in form of the request and what will it will send as a response. So this is the underlying importance of each and every layer. Post that we have a presentation layer. So presentation layer could be anything. It could be a call center application where you call to your help desk person and say probably this is what I need or it could be a chaos in your bank or an ATM machine or a chaos at the T-Mobile counter or it could be any any application, any more handheld device application, anything which actually interacts with the orchestration layer, right? So this is the entire layer of a SOA application. If you see a brown bar, a vertical bar, it is the SOA governance. So I'll just give you an overview. We have slides later on. What is the SOA governance? SOA governance is actually the process, the procedures which are all required to make a SOA application, to run a SOA application. Because SOA application, SOA is just a practice, right? SOA is not a protocol. So whenever any enterprise wants to have a SOA application, a SOA enterprise solution, there are certain SOA governance practices which an organization or the architects should follow. Failing to do that, the, the application, the SOA practices may not suffice the purpose of the project, right? We will, will go into details later on. Now, you have different, uh, you have an enterprise service bus, you have some security engines, you have operational management, you have different, so any middleware layer, so you can see that your middleware layer, your enterprise service layer and your orchestration layer is interacting with the ESB. It is the enterprise service bus, right. So we'll go into details in this slide itself in this session. What is the enterprise service bus, what it does and how it helps in the SOA solutions, right. The purpose of this slide is just to give you the overview of all what all entities are involved in a SOA solution, right? So I'm just moving ahead. Okay, now a very simple slide, very interesting slide, why SOA? So if you see the figure down below the arrow, both side arrow, you have an enterprise which is running some business enterprise has lot many internal systems. This could be a marketing team or this could be a manufacturing team, different different systems and every business unit for any enterprise has a system, right? Be it an audit system or be it a credit ranking system or the approval system, the loan eligibility system. So now on the left hand side you see a service to consumers. So let's say I am a end user to a particular enterprise so I would go to the enterprise for a particular solution, for a particular service. In huge enterprise solutions, now from the enterprise you see multiple arrows coming out. So what are these arrows? Let's say I take an example of a telecom system, a telecom application. I am a Blackberry customer. I go, I post a request to my T-Mobile provider and say, hey, I have purchased a new BlackBerry handheld device and starting tomorrow, can you give me a BlackBerry plan on my BlackBerry handheld device? So now, T-Mobile will not give you the BlackBerry service. It is the BlackBerry, it is the research in motion company which actually gives the BlackBerry service to T-Mobile for your account. So the T-Mobile, who is the enterprise in this example, will go, will send a request to T-Mobile, to BlackBerry. This is my customer. My customer has requested a BlackBerry plan. And this is the request. Please, please help me in furnishing this request to my end user. 
So this is a kind of example which I have tried to highlight. And this example is a pure SOA based example that you have services from different different providers. T-Mobile would not go into the details how a BlackBerry plan is given, how it is being activated. It just sends a request and it gets a response back and to the enterprise that okay some kind of a response, XML response. Based on that your BlackBerry services would be activated. So, so these are ways uh, by which you can apply the SOA practice. So one is the two centralized approach and one is the two decentralized approach and third is the combination of these two, right, which is called as BUS. BUS, I, I was discussing in my earlier example, enterprise service BUS. So whatever demerits that we have in the two decentralized approach are being catered in the two decentralized approach. Now we have a even the two decentralized approach has lot of issues and the very first issue is the point to point that we have lot of interactions here. If the system is not huge, if we do not have too many components in that system, then yes this is a good approach. But if we have lot of entities, lot of subsystems, then again this approach is a failure because if we have too many point to point interactions then we are going towards the non so approach because again the agility and reusability and serviceability all that issues will start creeping in. So a blend of these both these options is the bus option which is the complete and right the best blend of the so approach. What is this bus doing? So you can see there is a bus which is in the middle of it and at both side of this bus there are systems interacting. So this bus has actually introduced an additional middleware solution within this solution, right. So as I mentioned SOA is just a practice, right, how you design your system components, how you make them interact. Now if you introduce a bus, an enterprise service bus solution within this solution, it will become a best candidate for any SOA application. So probably we will go into details what this bus is all about. So as of now you just have to remember this bus is a middleware solution. And if you remember we see we saw a lot of examples like TIPCO, Oracle Fusion, right. So these are all middleware and bus solutions that we have from different different vendors. We have uh, enterprise service solution bus solutions from Oracle and we have enterprise service bus solutions from communities like Red Hat and JBoss which are open source communities which any one of you us can use as an open source. Right, so I am just moving ahead. Three tier architecture, so this slide talks about um, the difference between the architecture of a 3T architecture and a SOA architecture. So the very most important uh, dif uh, differentiating factor here is the homogeneous and the heterogeneous. In a SOA solution, in the SOA approach, you can have different, as what I said, it is a mush, it is a language independent system, right. So you can have .NET applications, you can have Scala applications, you can have legacy application de developed in Perl and different long time back and you can still continue to do, use those applications, right. But in a homogeneous environment, it is most likely that all the applications which are developed, which are there is a part of an ecosystem enterprise solution, they are all developed on a common platform, like they, they could be all Java platform, they could be all Microsoft technologies platform, right. So this is the main difference here and since we can have different, the environment is heterogeneous, we can bring in, we can plug in different different component, different different services from different vendors, from different service providers and here lies the concept of reusability, right. So this is the most important difference and we have other difference like uh, the core centric applications and uh, flexible composite applications that in three tier application, be it an MVC application, 
it is very code centric right for everything you have to define your modules and you have to code but in a flexible comp composite application model it is not about just writing a piece of code for every functionality that you want to build in it is more of a plug and play and integration right let's say there is a you want to build up a security for a single sign on functionality that you want to build so there is a framework which is already available from apache or there is a functionality there this functionality is already being given is already resides in your enterprise solution so in a soa solution you may not have to build it from scratch you can just use it right so these are the main differences i'll just go ahead with the next presentations okay so the next slide which i have is application centric what we are trying to highlight here is that at the left hand side of the applic of the slide you have a enterprise solution a uh, kind of a logistics application where you have the uh, manufacturing distribution supply and finance and business functionality is actually duplicated in each application that requires it so what does it mean that let's say a distribution system is there every distribution system has a reporting tool right or every distribution system has a way of securing access to the legitimate users so in case of a non soa application all the applications all let's say the security the security module will have to be replicated across all the applications right but which will not be the case of a soa implementation so what you will do every every application that you build up in a soa practice will actually integrate with the existing security services that you have built up so you will not have to reapply and app like it will not be a duplication effort and there would be no redundancy it will be just a kind of a enterprise application integration that you have to do with the available services for the same purpose right okay now we'll uh, come to uh, more detail what are the soa principles that we have right so so there are in in totality there are eight soa principles and i i assume uh, you must be already aware with uh, most of them so first is the centralized service contracts loose coupling abstraction composability discoverability reusability autonomy and statelessness so we have slides which talks about the details of each principle going ahead loose coupling so i guess we already discussed about this slide loose coupling right so if you see a example which i have depicted with the help of the figure at the right hand side i'll just read out the content for you create specific types of relationships within and outside of service boundaries with a constant emphasis on reducing dependencies between service contracts service implementation and service consumers so loose coupling is the essence or is the most important one of the most important uh, feature for any soa solution right if we try to couple different systems very with a very uh, heavy coupling amongst them then probably again the entire principle of having a soa solution is defeated right so i have one uh, question coming up from vijay uh, shamugan uh can you brief the first principle okay so uh vijay good that you asked the first principle the the service contract so standardized service contract is actually a combination of 
uh, the different principles that we have. So we have a slide later on which will actually talk about this uh, principle, right? So we have this slide. Okay, reusability. I think we have already discussed a couple of times that uh, what is reusability, how it helps, how it helps uh, the entire team. That reusable service has the following characteristics that uh, defined by agnostic functional context, logic is highly generic, has a generic and extensible contract and can be accessed concurrently. Right. Now I want to give you an example here. Reusability. Let's, let's take an example. I have built a logging framework for my application. I hope uh, all of you understand uh, what is a logging framework, what it does in an enterprise application. So logging framework is a kind of a logging utility which we develop just to create logs in an application, right? Let's say the application is run, running in a production environment, right? and the, the, the team who is actually supporting the production goes to the logs and see, uh, let's say there is a particular report which is not generated on any fine day. So what the production team will do, the production support team, they will go to the server and see whether the logs have been developed or not and what went wrong, why the logs have not been generated. So just an example. So let's say the purpose of the logging framework remains the same across all the applications, right? Be it a marketing application or be it a credit ranking application, be it a trade service application or be the email application, right? So let's say there is a team which develops a logging service, logging utility as a service and it exposes as a service. Now there are five different teams who are working on the same application. All five applications require the same feature to be implemented. But now there is a team, six team who has developed this application and anybody can use this application across different modules or across different applications. So this, but any team who's, who has, who's actually developing this application has to make sure that the logic which they generate has to be highly generic. Otherwise the reusability will not be addressed. I hope you got my point, right? When I say highly generic, that the methods used in that utility should be well overloaded or well overridden, right? A, a particular application may be sending an error code as a string or a particular application may be sending an error code as a integer, right? Or in byte array. So, the development of the reusability component has to be very generic. Major service types. So now we are getting more into the detail of SOA, but we are still on the principles. So we cover the eight principles. What are the different service types that we have? So we have the basic services and we have the composed services, right? So as the name suggests, that we can have a simple service just doing some uh, logic for you or we, we have a, a simple service who is a stateless service. We will come into the detail as well what is a stateless service and what is a stateful service with high degree of usability. Let us say the example of a basic service is a service who converts the Fahrenheit temperature into a centigrade which is a stateless service, right? You provide the temperature in Fahrenheit and it will give you a temperature in centigrade, right? It is stateless irrespective of the fact that that every time a new request has to be sent, a new response will be given and there would be no correlation between the earlier request and the earlier response, right? A kind of a stateless, that no state is being maintained. A composed service is kind of a more condensed service that it could be doing more complicated job that uh, it could be facilitating, let's say uh, 
we are, all of us use the Google, right? So let's say I have logged into Gmail account on my browser and now I go into a different tab and I want to use the Google Drive or the photos or YouTube. So now the Google service is so intelligent that it will not prompt you a username and a password again, right? What is what is happening in background? How how does the browser know that I have already been logged in into the Google account and for any further application which I want to access for Google, it does not require a password. This is an example of a single sign-on that your browser maintains some cache, right? And the browser is so intelligent that whenever you try to access a new application for Google, the Google interacts with the browser, checks the browser cache and see whether your cookies, your credentials already resides. And you have already logged in into the Google account, then it surpasses the step of logging into the account, like authorization with your... So these are some examples of the Compose services, right? And in order to implement a Compose service, the developer or the service developer has to make the interaction with a lot of backend systems. In my example, uh, the service has to interact with the browser cache, the service has to interact with the uh, different uh, temp files on your machine, Windows machine or any machine and the Google authorization code that whether the code has been validated, whether the security token still exists for that particular user on that particular browser, all that. I'll go to the next slide, probably we can just move a little at a uh, fast pace now. Uh, probably these are more theoretical concepts. Uh, I have one question from Arun. Single sign-on is composed service. Yes, the answer is yes. So any service which is not doing a very simple thing, as I mentioned, uh, Fahrenheit to degree conversion or uh, you give a latitude and longitude, right? And let's say a very good example of uh, a stateful service is uh, a Google map, right? You give a from and to direction of uh, your current location and your destination and you just hit the directions button and it gives you the direction. So in order to give you the directions, there is a lot which the Google does in the background. What is your current location, right? And it manipulates what, uh, what, whether you want to travel by air or whether you want to take a road. So there are so many examples that we have for the Compose services. Okay, there is one good question from Raghu Udapa who asked, can you elaborate on agnostic property in reusability? Okay, sure. So uh, does any one of us knows what is the literal meaning of agnostic? means not making too many assumptions, right? So, so probably Raghu has, has himself uh, uh, answered this question that uh, you cannot make too, too many assumptions while if you want to reuse any component, right? That as I was mentioning the logging example, the logger example, so the the team who is actually designing and developing this logger application cannot assume, cannot take the example for granted that an application will only send me this message. The application will, only, will not have the error code. So to the best of the knowledge, which actually comes with the experience and hands off, any team, any design team, any component which has which which has been developed with the intent of reuse by different system should not be developed by taking too many assumptions right the the component should be so generic that there should be a flexibility that each and every application each and every component who wants to use that as a reusable component should be able to do that let's say if i am not able to reuse that component right so the overall purpose of the reusability is defeated. So this is another principle of SOA. Uh, uh, 
guys, I'm I'm uh, taking some time and explaining these principles because if I don't give an example here, probably then uh, the slide uh, the content would uh, look more theoretical to you and the very high deep dive examples that we have later on in the last 30 40 slides uh, if you don't uh, understand the concept the principle well then it would be harder for all of us to uh, get a deep dive into the examples that we have in the later part of the present uh, the content so it's so okay so services exercise a high level of control over their underlying runtime execution environment represents the ability of a service to carry out its logic independently of outside influences. To achieve this, services must be isolated. So the, the overall principle of autonomy is that let's say if I, I have a service built for, a, for doing a particular job, the service itself should not be dependent on too many external entities, right? So the service itself should be self doable of the job it is required to do. It should not be the way that let's say I call a service and in turn internally that particular service calls another service, right? So this is a concept of isolation that the service, whatever service is supposed to do should do it by itself and this is a very uh, fundamental uh, underlying principle that we have. Now the next principle that we have is the abstraction which is one of the most most important principle abstraction. Uh, abstraction as, as we know by its literal meaning that uh, hiding the internal details of the implementation. Like this is even one of the principles of the OOPS programming that we have, right? So let's say there is a consumer, right? There, there, you have a service, you have a business requirement that a person wants to check for whether he or she is eligible for a loan or not. The person applies for a loan and there is a loan eligibility, there is a credit check which the loan application does before actually issuing a credit note and a loan eligibility sanction letter to the client. So this is something which is a regulation thing. The processing of uh, the evaluation of a loan eligibility for any individual. There are a lot of steps which are involved in evaluation of the eligibility of a loan or a credit rating. So the bank or the credit company or the loan company would not like to share the details of the implementation how that eligibility is calculated to the external parties right so this is the abstraction that whatever your service is doing you would not want to hide the implementation you would want to hide the implementation, the underlying details of the service to the outside world, right? So this is pretty simple, right? But this is very important. But what is not covered in abstraction is that any service has a provider and it has a consumer, right? Let me talk more on uh, the terminologies of a service now. So service is always the contract between a provider and a consumer. So a contract says this is a service, in order to consume this service, will I, uh, this is what you have to send in the request and this is what you will get in the response, right. So these details, this is about the discoverability and the consume part of the service. This is not never a part of the abstraction because if such details are abstracted from the outer world, then probably the service would not be consumed and the service, if the service is not consumed then the purpose of having the service is, is not met. So I have one question coming up from Hugh Appling. Hugh asked me, does not abstraction hiding all the processes involved conflict somewhat with autonomy? Uh, 
I would not say I would not say yes because uh, autonomy simply states that let's say you develop a service S1 and you go for for S1 let's say S1 has to compute something and do a business job. So S1 should not internally go to S2 and S2 eventually should go to S3. So in that case the S1 itself should be designed in a way that it does whatever it is being asked or designed or being developed. So this is what the autonomy principle says. Okay, so uh, Hugh has a very uh, interesting question here. Uh, the example which you gave of a credit application seem to have involved uh, many other services. Yes, so so you we, so probably now we all have to understand the ecosystem. Let's say there is a uh, credit application. So credit application system may have 20 backend services that would be required to invoke in order to compute the credit ranking, ranking for a customer. But th all, these te all these systems which, which would be required in order to interact would be a sequence of steps, right? Let's say a, a system A or service A would give something based on what the system A gives, right? The service A gives, you go back to the service B and says, now this is what I have based on the credit card's history. Now you give me this. So it is a logical sequence of services which are being established. But it is not that, that you go to a particular service A for something and the service back actually goes to service B and C and lot more. I hope uh, Hugh that answers my question. But these are more of a principles, right? Statelessness. So statelessness is very important that uh, service contracts only essential information and information about services is limited to what is published in service contracts. So now I am in the slide of statelessness. So there are two examples that uh, one is the concept of statelessness and one is the concept of stateful. Stateful concept is that that you invoke a service S1 and post, once you have the response of service S1, you go to service S2 based on the response that you get from S1. So this is a stateful way of accessing mechanism of accessing your services. One is the stateless which I al already talked about. You don't care what was the previous response or what was the previous request. Every request would be individual treated as by itself and uh, there would be no relation of what the initial requests were or what would be the post request. Now the uh, diagram at the right hand says minimize the time it remains stateful. So you have to design, you have to design your apps or applications in, in such a way that yes, a service can be stateful. It can be, but most of the services that you design should be stateless, right? And the you should minimize the time that it remains stateful because if you make a service as stateful, there are a lot of overheads which are being done, right? You have to maintain some caching, you have to uh, serialize the data, you have to persist that data, right? In your cache, in your system cache, in your server cache, based on different implementation that you have, right? I'll, I'll just move ahead. Now this is the, uh, I think somebody asked me uh, that uh, just to cover the first principle, standardized service contacts. Uh, this is a very important principle in a sense that 
as I have already given you a heads up that service is actually a contract between a provider and a consumer, right? So let's say uh, you all access your train tickets, you all book your train tickets uh, uh, from your mobile app or from different different uh, interfaces that you have. So any service which has been developed has a purpose that it should be consumed by the right consumer, right? So services use service contract to express their purpose and express their capabilities. I give you a very good example here that most of the web applications or different platforms that we see be the e-commerce platform, we always, now we see that most of the applications they have the option to log in with Facebook or Google. Do you guys agree? If one of you can say yes in the chat window or the question window, that would be great. Okay, so what is what is this login with Facebook and login with Google functionality? What it is all about? That it is a kind of a reusability that it has been integrated. That okay, you don't you don't do a fresh sign up on this website. We can authorize you. We can create your account using a login with Facebook or login with Google account. So this is a service right this is a reusability right so there is a contract now Facebook or Google has exposed their API or their service login service or Google map service on their portals on their websites for the developer teams whoever wants to use those APIs can come and use them right and this is the service is all about this is how it needs to be consumed no matter what the development team is developing an application in .NET or a Java framework or Ruby framework or Grails framework, this functionality, this service is available and this is the contract to use. Probably you guys can also go and check sometime that uh, how these uh, functionalities are. I have a website, I can embed a page to uh, Google map from the Google map that this is the direction for my office right we have seen that so these these are all this is the overall intention that whenever we have a service we we all we always have a contact we always have a document that this is the purpose of the service and this is the capability and this is how to, it needs to be used and uh, uh, if you guys know uh, I hope you most of you have already have some heads up on what the SOAP services are and what the REST services are. In SOAP services, uh, you have a WSDL, Web Service Definition Language. So this Web Service Definition Language is a service contract which your service provider will give you. Let's say uh, I want to uh, integrate the capability of booking an Amtrak ticket from my application, right? I'm building up a portal for booking some tickets. So Amtrak will give me the API, the contract, the wisdom of how I can use its check status or book ticket uh, services with my application, right? So this is a service contract and the service contracts are standardized. So for SOAP we have a wisdom as a contract and, and we can also have a document but if we, if one has the wisdom, if you give the consumer the wisdom, the consumer will not come back to you and ask for any additional document because it is a contract document. I have one question from Hugh coming up. Uh, do service contracts in this definition generally address issues of performance and capacity? Uh, no. So Hugh, the answer is the service contracts will never talk about the or address issues related to performance and capacity. Never. It is the uh, deployment, it is the deployment architecture, it is the how the SOA team or the architect team has deployed this application, right. The end user will never know what is the performance metrics and what is the capacity handling and uh, whether this application uh, is threat safe or not, whether how many multiple clients can access this application at one point. So the answer is no. Ah, probably you can uh, reply back uh, with something if you have anything more to ask. 
and thank you for asking uh, Hugh this question. This was a very good question. Discoverability. Again, uh, let's say I have a service which has been designed, developed, available to use, right? But what if if I not tell my end customers or consumers that this is the service which is there? So discoverability is something that you are documenting, you are registering your service in your service uh, list that this service is available. Let's say, uh, let I, I take an example of Google, right? So if I take uh, uh, Google Maps is not just uh, restricted or limited to finding directions, right? Uh, we have lot many uh, APIs or lot, lot many services being developed from Google for different different purposes, right? Uh, so uh, I take an example, let's say you want to construct a new house in New Jersey and you are at a particular place and now you want to see that at what point of time you will have sunlight at this place and what is the longitude and latitude of this place, right? So there are so many APIs and services which are being exposed, which are being already developed and shared by Google. But what if I as a consumer, I'm building a website, what if I do not know about these services? The services, the intention of developing those services will go in vain, right? Because I would not know about those services. So there is a repository which a service provider maintains about what all services is being developed, are there, are there other services uh, in beta version or are there services stable, uh, who should consume these services and all, all about that. So this is another important principle. Now we have covered all the principles of the SOA. Now uh, a very quick look at again service or architecture organized by layers, right. So it has reuse, flexible composition, separation of concerns, policies may vary by layer, customization in higher layers, functional standardization in lower layers. So what, what this slide is trying to depict, what is, what is the intent of this slide? This slide is actually uh, talking about that service oriented architecture that any, any is is spread across the different layers of the applications that you have and is actually also has different different types of uh, services it develops, right. So these are the important points in a context that that whenever you have different service architecture organized, so there should be different layers that it should be reused, it should have a flexible composition and they could be basic services, they could be some composed services, how would you present those? So these are some elementary things to know about layers, but yes, once we'll take some more examples at the end, you'll understand them better. <coughs> Sorry. The composability. Uh, services are effective composition participants regardless of the size and complexity of the composition. Allow my capabilities to be repeatedly combined with those of other services. So composability, so the overall intent of this principle is that whatever the service is supposed to do uh, from a reusability principle standpoint or whatever it is required to do that it should actually solve the purpose, right? If you are searching for directions, right? It should, it should give you the direction back, right? It, it should not prompt you that, uh, uh, do you, do you uh, please go to this service for accessing this, right? Whatever request that you are giving, whatever parameters that you are giving, it should give back to the response. So it says ensure services are able to participate in multiple compositions to solve multiple larger problems, right? So it is, so the composability and reusability have a very thin line between them. Service execution should 
should be efficient in that individual processing and should be highly tuned. The last point is flexible service contracts to allow different types of data exchange requirements for similar functions. So what, what composability is trying to highlight this principle states that the, when, I, when the reusability principle comes into picture, so the scope of reusability should be wide in terms of that it should uh, not only serve a particular data format, right? That a particular service should be able to uh, take XML as a request and should be also be able to take the plain HTML as a uh, request and some other different formats. So it is not that it, it can be reused, but it can be used, reused across different variety, right? For, uh, across different geographies, across different needs. Acro let's say uh, a China person should be able to access the same service with a Chinese language and it should, should not be restricted only with English, right? So the overall scope of the service should be extended and elevated. So now we are actually getting into the details of the services, what all components they have. Uh, till now we have only, only, only been talking about uh, what all benefits that we get, what all different components they have, but now we are getting into more details around, around those. Right, so we have a business capability ring at the bottom of the screen. On top of that, we have core APIs and foundation service blocks. Now, can you see we have three different types of service layers. One is the basic service, right? And after that, we have portal or smart clients. And after that, we have the component service. So if I start with the first block, which is pointing to the core API and foundation service block, data-centric and logic-centric consisting services, highly usable, stateless. So this circle ring is actually pointing to the foundation services, right? Services which are actually doing the, the biggest things of for any business, right? Let's say for, uh, let's say for a telecom, uh, for a telecom application, uh, the example for this foundation service block would be a billing and a charging service. Let's say, I'm not sure how, whether how many of you are aware of a prepaid mobile that, uh, but this predominantly happens in different uh, geographies that uh, you, you buy a scratch card or you go online and you, you have a prepaid mobile, right? So you, you, let's say you want to uh, recharge your mobile with a $50 amount. So you go to the kiosk or you log into your uh, at and or Verizon account and you pay the amount and you get some code. When you enter that code, your mobile will be credited for the $50 balance and now you can make calls or use data or text for another $50. Right. So this is a kind of a foundation service for a telecom ecosystem. Right. If this goes down, then probably the entire charging and billing system will go down, right? Now, on top of that, you have you will have some component service. What could be the example of that component service? That component service is something that which is not so important as far as the existence of that particular enterprise solution goes, but they are doing some different things, right? There could be uh, a, a component service could be doing a, a reconciliation process that a customer has recharged the mobile, the uh, amount has been debited from his credit card and now there is a reconciliation process which runs in the background which checks whether your mobile provider gets, gets that money, whether a $50 has been credited to you and it, it just do a cross check, it just reconciles all the system just to make sure that your order happens 
safe, well on time and there is nothing pending from your order, right? So this is the example of a component service. Now again we have some basic service, basic service like uh, you could have a service who is uh, doing a, a, a kind of a background check for you, a kind of a service who is actually uh, doing an authentication for you on your my Vodafone or your my T-Mobile account when you log in and the portal and the smart client services are the different services which runs in background which checks that okay you have uh, logged in into the T-Mobile account from a handheld device okay now your request will go to a particular server there could be a case when you could be uh, visiting a T-Mobile shop near your office and you have given a request and this charging is being done by a customer agent who is helping you at a T-Mobile shop or a Shopee, right? So based on the different interfaces being used based on the criticality whether you are a privileged customer, whether what type of customer you are. So there are some other different smart client services which runs on the enterprise solutions just to facilitate the business so that the end user is not impacted, right? So any questions, I'm just uh, moving on and any questions, I'll, I'll, I can take your questions. Okay, so a governance. Uh, if you guys remember, we saw a figure where uh, we talked about different layers of SOA, service layer, enterprise layer, presentation layer, middleware layer and there was a green block, the vertical block which was showing us SOA governance and I said that SOA governance is uh, the practices, the policies which an enterprise must follow in order to make your SOA solution a success. So governance is a program that makes sure people do what is right. In conjunction with software, governance controls the development and operation of software. So, so the purpose of this is that you have to establish a SOA organization, governance, SOA board that governs SOA efforts and breaks down capabilities into non-overlapping services. So the slide is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. The message is very clear that it says that there has to be a SOA board, right? Because when I talk of these, these big solutions, right, the T-Mobile solutions or Bank of America solutions, these are pretty big solutions in terms of size, complexity and the volume of customers it handles. If I share my example with you, uh, based on my previous examples, I have worked, I have the privilege of working with the biggest telecom players in US, right? So I have the privilege of working with uh, Comcast, T-Mobile and Verizon, that is why I am taking so many telecom examples. So the, the nature of the systems and the systems are so huge that uh, there is a dedicated SOA body for these systems which sits across geographies, right? There, there could be a person who sits in Philadelphia and there is a person who sits in Denver. So wherever these solutions are designed and they are architected, we have people, we have representatives who actually govern these SOA principles. And what is the sole aim of having this body is just to make sure that we don't overlap the services. This is the very first principle that we may have a solution ready, available, but it is not discovered well. It is not documented well. The contract is not, uh, is not sufficing the purpose. So this is the one aim of having a SOA governance body or SOA governance practices. You may not have people every time, you just lay down some foundation in the form of a document and make sure that your architect team or your solution design team follows that. Again we have, so we will continue to talk about the SOA governance. So what the SOA governance is? SOA governance talks about the policies, the processes and the metrics, right? Uh, now uh, it's been a while I have asked uh, any one of you a question. Uh, what is uh, 
how does matrix helps here what is the relevance of having a matrix in a soa solution as a soa governance what is the relation between soa and oa so oa is the object oriented approach and soa is the service oriented approach. so what is the relation so uh, which is, uh, there is no direct one on one relation between the soa and oa right oa is again a principle which uh, any programming construct follows just to make sure that again uh, it is it your classes are abstract your composability so there are some common features there are some common elements between the oa approach and the soa approach so uh, just just to uh, finish that answering that your question that uh, soa is actually a bigger concept right soa is not just that uh, from a reusability stand, standpoint or from the abstraction standpoint soa uh, is a caters a big picture uh, in a sense that uh, soa makes sure that whatever enterprise solutions that you are building up they are well they are they should be very agile they should be well integrated and they should they should be language independent which your object orientation uh, your object oriented approach does not take care right so object oriented approach is just to uh, make sure that uh, whatever construct that you follow is based on the principles you overload your functions well you override your functions well but so is much more than to that i hope i i have answered your question matrix is to make sure if the response follows sle okay so i would say yes uh, this is one of the criteria of having a matrix but there is even more to that of having a matrix so okay i'll i'll just uh, share uh, my thoughts so matrix there are so many purpose of having a matrix matrix also gives you a fair detail of how many clients that you have for a particular service how many uh, providers how many uh, clients uh, got the uh, appropriate response when they tried consuming the service how many clients are facing issues what all needs to be changed for a particular service for the different clients right and matrix also give you all the details of the entire ecosystem that how many services are deployed one service can have multiple versions of it running at the same time right let's say uh, google maps come with a different api let's say uh, i give an example that uh, instead of typing in the directions google comes with a new version of google api which has the option to key in the direction with the help of a voice this is a new version now they want the existing users to start to continue using the existing service version where you type in the direction but there could be few new mobile phones available in the market where you can use the google map with your with your voice that uh, let's say you want to go to edison station uh, in new jersey to a different station in new york and you can speak out right and google maps very well understand those so this is a different so matrix give you a very clear picture of what the version is how many clients are using which version uh, what is the performance of each version what is the sla of each version how many versions are down all that probably even bigger picture of what i just narrated so uh, i have couple of questions so matrix can be used for analyzing the performance uh, vijay is asking this question the answer is yes the result of matrix is shared is accessible to all the soa governance team all the solution design team to make decisions on the future solutions how want to how what changes that they want to make in their existing solutions let's say uh, after 2 years 90% of the users are voice based no none so 
what the SOA governance team and solution design team will do that they will uh, they will uh, make more clusters they will deploy this version of service on more clusters on more servers so that more and more people more and more clients can access this and they will continue to reduce the deployment architecture and the request capability of the earlier text version of it. So metrics is always helpful for taking decisions forward, designing the services forward, re releasing the new version of services forward. And this is very small thing which I talked about. Metrics is even more to that, but because of constraint of time, we cannot discuss everything. We already talked about policies is simple that uh, we, we have to make sure that we follow the best practices, we address them we have the best te technical solution and policies also ensures that we have the best of configuration management and release management plans. I hope you guys understand what I mean by configuration management and release management jargons and terminologies. Release management and configuration management are related to how you deploy your software, how you release your software, how you notify your clients that a new version is available. Right? processes and enforce policies, system driven processes, human driven processes. So processes are for the humans and for the system, right? Code check-in, check-in, check-out, build, automation testing, unit test, metrics is something which you already talked about. And feel free to share your questions. This is again very interesting slide uh, from a SOA governance standpoint that now we are discussing that what all the SOA governance does. In a nutshell, we are just trying to summarize everything now, once again. Right? So, we already saw that uh, ring uh, picture before that and it is just in continuation to what we discussed earlier. So, we have core APIs, we have service foundation blocks, so now we have different different stakeholders who actually participates in this entire SOA development process and SOA governance process, SOA release process from scratch to the development to execution to release management and to maintain that going forward. So SOA we already talked about we have policy standards models patterns, we have enterprise architects, we have service designers and we have SOA board, right? So these are, so uh, service designers is the solution design team which gives the inputs on the business service views and the technical views come from the architects and the developers. I'll give you one example here. I always uh, focus on stating examples so that you must uh, be wondering what is the role of a service designer here? If any one of you can ping me in form of a question, what is your thoughts on what could, what are, who are service designers, what they do, why, how they fit into this SOA application development and governance process. What is the significance of this service designers? Uh, service designers are people who actually are not to, uh, very high technical people or technical architects, but people who are part of the business solution team. People who takes care of the regulatories, because if I talk about changes in any solution and any system, so changes can be categorized in different ways like you have, you can have uh, the regulatory changes, right? Be it a healthcare domain or a telecom domain or a finance domain, there are always regulatory changes which keeps on coming into the systems, right? So, and those systems uh, and those changes are very uh, time critical and they are bound to be implemented in the system well ahead on time because of the legalities and which are involved, right? There could be some business advancement changes, right? There could be technological changes. There could be changes related to the different businesses or different uh, new entities which have been introduced in the system. So these are 
this service designer teams or solution solution design teams they are people who take care of all these changes right so even uh, the implementation is not soa based they are still part of uh, every organization any or any organization right but in a typical uh, soa based uh, organization where the, the solutions are typical service based we call them as service designers so i'm moving on to the next slide okay so this is a very important slide and uh, i'll try to cover this quickly because it has a lot of content to look at i'll just start with the soa capability matrix which is there at right hand side of the screen so you see four silos here integration quality of service information and governance so whenever you implement any technology you implement any practices you implement any uh, new processes so there is a, always a capability mix that you can infer out right you can create what all that you plan to achieve and you are actually achieving for sake let's say uh, you have any uh, project management practices in your organization in your project or any uh, capability maturity processes like the cmmi processes that we have for the it organizations or the iso international standards organization so every processes that we follow has a capability matrix which defines the underlying capability for that particular process so similarly for soa we have integration we have quality of service which is uh, commonly known as qos information and governance so integration mediation routing transformation loose coupling service contract and identity propagation saml so integration mediation we all know what is mediation routing and transformation loose coupling service contract i'll just take one example from mediation remember uh, we took an example of uh, esb enterprise service bus and routing so and transformation so these three capabilities actually comes from a enterprise service bus solution what this mediation and route uh, routing and transformation is all about that mediation routing is this any service bus provides is that probably let's say uh, you have sent two uh, request parameters in your service right and there are two version of services which are already aware on the server uh, let's say uh, you want to buy uh, you want to let's say you want to uh, buy a train ticket and in that you are given from and to an op option and there is another service which which is so smart that it has four parameters that you give a from to options the train id or a train number and the time so if you are giving four options then automatically your server your request will be routed to the version of service which has these four parameters so this is dynamic routing which is done by the esb similarly for the mediation mediation is something that uh, there are examples that uh, let's say uh, you have a service right now you don't want to expose that service to your consumers you built a proxy service in form in front of your main service the original service why you do that uh, let's say the bill uh, if you guys have heard about the billing system let's say there is a service which charges you six dollar per request if any consumer request for that service right now the criteria to consume that service that you have to provide a customer account number the customer account number is always a 16 digit number now let's say there is a client who sends a 10 digit account number by mistake and the service will be invoked and the service will return in response invalid account number right but now 
since uh, there are a lot of millions of hits every day and by metrics the service design team comes to know or your organization comes to know, the consumer comes to know, 50% of the requests are being, are not being, are, are not returning a successful response because the account number which is being sent is not incorrect. Or the account number which is being sent, the account does not exist. So for every such request, a $6 revenue is being lost, right? And just think of a hypothetical situation when we have millions and thousands of such hits coming for every day. Now what we'll do, we create a mediation in front of that service, a kind of a proxy service. What that service will do, it will check whether the account number is 12 digit account number, whether the account number is a legitimate number, it meets all the standard, all the criteria for the account number to be valid. And once all that seems validation criteria seems to have been passed, then only your request will eventually go to the actual business service. So this is a kind of a environment, this is a kind of a infrastructure that you have built on top of the real service. So this is an example of mediation. So again loose coupling, service contract, identity propagation, we already discussed that uh, uh, we, uh, we, I have talked about the example from Google that uh, any person who logs into the Google application if tries to access any other application will not have to re-enter the authorization credentials. It is done automatically. So this is one of the very important aspects of uh, security and identity propagation because this is not just with the login. There are so many security, there are the so many security constraints which happens in the financial applications. That if you log into a system, your credentials, your token is, uh, is retained in the server cache or in the client machine cache for some time so that just to ensure that you don't, do not have to log in again and again. This is a very important principle these days. Uh, quality of service again you have uh, non-functional requirements, you have service level agreements that uh, this service should give you a response in uh, 5 uh, million second or uh, whatever is the SLA. Information again, reusability, statelessness, we already discussed these are SOA principles and the governance, we already discussed the governance that you are doing a proper versioning of your services and you are following the right policy and guidelines. If you come back, so uh, it says opportunity for incremental development, deployment, maintenance and extension of business applications. So this, so any SOA governing body or if any organization is practicing the right SOA practices, what is achieved? So you are achieving the opportunity for the right incremental development, deployment and maintenance and extension of business application. This is the entire scope for any organization, right? If you guys remember, I showed you a very jazzy kind of a picture or in the slide one that IT business application and what all challenges they face and so this is again comprehending the same thing, right? So again, it, it is again going to the same point that why we are using SOA. So again, if you follow this, what are the paybacks? What do you get in return? Again, all the demerits of having a non-SOA architecture and highly coupled and integration architecture are the paybacks. That you, it will be very agile, it will be accurate, speedy timelines, availability, recoverability. So everything is the so what we saw earlier, the pitfalls have now become the paybacks. The causes is again the reverse of the causes earlier. It is now loosely coupled, no single responsibility principle, like no uh, single uh, the spoken hub architecture that we saw earlier. And fine grain instead of coarse grain implementation and low cost and return high OI and well defined COE. 
COE is the center of excellence that the organization is can be now be future aligned with the future roadmap. I'm going further and if you have any questions you can come back to me on the question window. So now, so now you'll find things to be very repetitive because uh, we've already covered and discussed most of the aspects in a theoretical standpoint. Again, applying SOAR challenges that uh, even if you apply SOAR, you will have the challenge of a reuse that you have to make sure the reuse is done properly and effectively and you have to redesign your services uh, so that they may they meet the criteria of reuse without creating an overhead. But to an extent every reusing of any component always does introduce an at least some extent of an overhead, right? But you have to minimize the overhead and make the reusability part of it even bigger. Increase complexity, so you have to make sure that the reusability does not increase the complexity and it is a best sharing of responsibilities. When I say sharing of responsibility, potential service user must be involved in the design process and will have influence on the service design. So one person cannot do the same thing and one person cannot do all things. So when you define your SOA governance process, when you have the SOA team, when you have SOA architects, so you have to have a very clear defined share responsibilities so that it is a win-win situation for everybody. SOA is an evolutionary step. If you remember we talked about it, the SOA is not something that I download a framework, I embed it, I include the dependencies in my build path and SOA is ready. No, SOA is a practice, SOA is a uh, practice which needs to be done, which needs to be evolved and it is not, it is not something with, which can be done from day one. So SOA is evolved over a period of time. If you see big uh, e-commerce sites, if you see big social platforms like Twitter, Flickr, Facebook, Pinterest, right, these are all big, big examples of SOA implementation. Twitter, uh, if anyone, know, anyone of you knows uh, what, uh, how many tweets uh, Twitter server receives in one day or how many photos are uploaded on Flickr in one day, right. So the number is in billions, not even millions, right. So these are all implementations of SOA solutions. The most biggest and heaviest websites in the world, be it the e-commerce solutions or be it uh, photo sharing sites, they are all SOA examples. And you'll, you guys will have a very good picture of uh, the implementation part uh, starting tomorrow because uh, tomorrow session will give you a very good insight of uh, how the SOA solutions are and how they work and some more internals about them. I'm moving ahead. Applying SOA. So there is, uh, there, so I'm trying to illustrate here uh, a pre-SOA and a post-SOA graph in terms of the change request, right? And so there is a graph uh, which shows the green field agony and renovation and the vertical arrow shows a paralysis ability to deliver and agility. The graph is, uh, the arrows are going from red to green and so the overall intent of this slide is that when, when you have a pre-SOA architecture or pre-SOA implementation, then it is most in the agony state, right? Things are not good and the system is not, is not in a healthy state, right? It is still in the paralysis state the ROI for change request, the duplication of effort, non-agility, everything is too high. But now, when we have a SOA implementation, we have a transition phase, immediately after the transition phase, the ability to deliver has been increased, the agility is increased and the renovation capability is increased. So from agony, agony the solution has moved to a renovation state. 
pre soa after soa and the transition phase the agility is coming up the agony is coming down and the system is moved from paralysis state to a revamped and a better ability to deliver stage and we have two three stages pre soa transition soa and on the vertical graph we have agility being defined and before soa the change request were in a paralysis state in a sense that roi was high and the duplication efforts were high and the agility was less uh, so greenfield is a very common term right i use this term very often with my clients in us so greenfield is a terminology which we use for implementation or i would not use a word project here but for implementations which actually start from the scratch i give an example uh, 4G telecom projects or implementations in US were actually all greenfield projects because 4G was new and 4G was initially started by AT&T in US, right? So when we did this project, it was a greenfield project for us because there was no infrastructure that was available. There was no services that were available for 4G services. There were new devices, there were new infrastructure set up by telecom regulatory authorities. There were new modems, new setups, new hardware, everything was new, right? And it was not tried by any vendor before that. So any implementation which is new for the first time and which needs a development and execution from the start, scratch, which needs a start from the scratch is a greenfield project. So, so I happened to work for two of the greenfield uh, projects with my clients and uh, they had legacy applications which were not SOA applications. So we had to migrate a couple of application, existing applications to SOA and the existing 4G application from the scratch which was a greenfield project. S solution benefits, SOA solution benefits probably now you would be able to correlate them uh, very quickly. Service, everything that we would have would be in the form of service. We would have messaging, we would have message control, we would have message translation. If you remember I discussed and I uh, shared my interpretation on mediation and data transformation. So this is all about message, right? So you can monitor, you have a metrics and you, you can reuse, right? I hope this should be clear. So again, uh, some more SOA solutions. Complex event processing, service composition. So, you, so now the system would have the capability to develop new change requests, new functions, combinations very rapidly. Discovery asset wrapping. Asset wrapping is ability to integrate existing assets. This could be hardware assets. This could be technical assets. This could be framework assets. This could be assets like uh, you are using Spring uh, as a framework. You are using Struts. You are using logging frameworks. You are different using different identity management frameworks. So if you migrate these systems, you can easily do a asset wrapping. Virtualization, if you remember I discussed the six dollar example with you that in front of a business service you expose a proxy service. So this is a service virtualization that you do with the help of an enterprise service bus. So because for every bad request you don't want to lose six dollar. This is a very similar thing. Model driven implementation, ability to develop new functions reliability. So what is the difference between service composition and model driven implementation? Like th there is a very small thin line between these two that uh, model driven implementation is the ability to de develop new functions, right? So you already have the infrastructure ready, you already have the SOA governance, the processes, things have been already been developed, they already have the process defined and if new things comes in, right, be it a new change, 
or it is a new functionality. The new functionality will be articulated, would be implemented or would be uh, exactly implemented in the way as it is implemented in the existing system, right? So it will be the scope of the development, the timelines of the development would be fast. Service composition is that ability to develop new function combinations rapidly. That whatever new things that you are developing, be it a new module or a new service or whatever, it would have the capability to be able to integrate with the existing components, right? So the capability of integration with the existing framework would be very fast. And uh, if I answer that in one word, it would be more of a kind of a plug and play that you will be doing, right? I'm just moving ahead with the next slide. So now we are uh, at the conclusion and summary. So if done correct, SOA is just another architectural fad. So you have a business and you have a technology and SOA is between them. So SOA is all about managing change, right? Because any real life example that you take from any domain, from any business entity, from any type of business, any business is actually a uh, undergoes change, any business evolves, right? Any business that we take. And SOA, the intent of bringing a SOA is to make sure that the changes evolve from business to technology in the most best way they could be, right? So, but yes, we have to understand that SOA is complex. SOA requires governance, SOA requires executive management buy-in and SOA requirement commitment with resources. So SOA is not something that I, I would reiterate once again, is not something that you can bring in on day one. SOA is a very niche practice that you have to build within your organization. And what you get when you build it and is that you start managing your business, you start managing your change and the road between a business to a technology becomes smooth. Now uh, I come to the most interesting part of these slides, some real life examples that I was talking about, but now uh, we would be covering these examples at a faster pace. So solution to integrate billing, provisioning database and web base systems. So again, uh, I've tried to incorporate couple of examples from SOA that how this SOA examples can help you in integrating and which will actually serve the purpose of reusability, autonomy, this, all that. So now, since we have gone through the SOA and non-SOA, now it is a time to give you a picture of before SOA and after SOA, right. I would have given you this slide at, for the first 10 slides of this content, but I intentionally did not do this. Reason? I did not want to show you the difference so early at the, uh, for this session. After uh, like discussing the SOA and the after SOA, a very much in detail, the merits and the demerits. Now it is time for you to take a look and realize how things change for a similar imp implementation which is a kind of a banking application implementation before SOA and after SOA. So if you have any doubts, any questions you can ask, but uh, this slide is actually the crux of what is we have been discussing. So I have one question coming from Hugh Appling. Uh, thanks Hugh for asking this question. What is OSB adapters? Yeah. So OSB is uh, Oracle service bus, which is one proprietary product from Oracle. Very similar to, it is the ESB implementation, the enterprise service bus. So enterprise service bus is a concept and OSB is one of the products from Oracle for this 
we have different different products from different vendors for the ESB solutions. So OSB is a uh, is not uh, like is a paid solution, right? And we have different free open source implementations from Red Hat, Apache, and other communities. Good that you ask. Okay, the second part of your question: What are adapters? So, if you guys remember, I I was discussing about a middleware solution, right? What are middlewares and uh, ESB is nothing but a middleware solution that with the help of ESB you are bringing a middleware solution into picture to enhance your SOA governance to make sure that you are practicing the best SOA solution. So you are not going for a very centralized solution or you are not going a very decentralized solution. You are going for a blend of both. I hope you guys remember that slide where we had three options, right? So adapter is nothing but a kind of a, uh, as its name suggests that, that in the ESB solution adapters help you to integrate your ESB with the backend system. Let's say for any uh, enterprise solution you have lot of backend systems like billing system, fraud management system, different charging systems, different databases access systems, control systems. So what this middle, uh, middleware solution does, they, with the, they have some this Oracle service bus or enterprise service bus applications, they have a construct by which you can connect to these applications with the help of adapters. So they have some APIs written, they have some components which are kind of a drag and drop based on what tool that you use. Let's say you want to connect to a database, right? So how would you connect to a database from uh, your app application? Let's say you have a Java application. How will you connect to that uh, application which is a DB, backend application from your Java? So we connect a database from any application with the help of a data source, right? We should have a data source by which any application of any type can access that database, be it a Java, Perl, Microsoft, .NET. So we build adapters to integrate the backend applications with the ESB solution, right? So now you can see a change between before SOA and after SOA for the same application. Again, uh, a reiteration to what we discussed that you have to evaluate, you have to, since SOA is an evolutionary process, you have to evaluate SOA, you have to explore SOA, you have to envision SOA and you have to execute SOA. And it is a continuous improvement process. So this is a very release management related term, continuous improvement, CI. I hope you must be aware of this term. If not, then probably you can Google. And we have, we have identified the deliverables, we have identified the life cycle process and we have identified the continuous process. So the SOA governance is your continuous process. So this is again a, a very high level detail implementation of uh, uh, how do you implement SOA and what what is, so this is the implementation plan. How you actually do the your releases and this is the phased migration model. And this is in very detail. So the moment if any one of you is uh, going for a SOA project after this course ends, then probably any one of you can refer to this slide for more details how it happens and if you have any question then probably at any point of time you can come back to Edureka or by posting a ticket and we will help you, right? But this is a very detailed slide and maybe you can uh, go through that later on. So again, uh, business driven development of to the SOA solution. So again you do a service analysis, right? You do a service modeling and design, you do a service development and then you are do a process implementation. So this slide is very important for all of you and this is one of my favorite slides here that however uh, the process remains the same that you do analysis, you do a modeling and design you do have development and you do implementation. 
post release, but the construct, the semantics and the terminologies used here are little different. So, and this is all part of the SOA governance and SOA practices. Uh, what is SOA best practice at a glance that uh, again SOA strategies, SOA practice profile, dedicated center of excellence and some again enterprise 2.0 strategies. So success implementation experience for our various clients, SOA framework and methodologies. So this is a very theoretical uh, slide but uh, these are actual uh, the SOA best practices that uh, a SOA governing body has to follow. Failing this the overall purpose of having a SOA solution is defeated. Right. So this is uh, the SOA strategies is rich experience across multiple domains such as telecom, media, retail and manufacturing. So SOA solutions can be implemented and are being implemented across all domains. So tomorrow in tomorrow's session we will see some examples on who is doing what in SOA. Service and practice highlights. So again this slide is uh, people who are who would be taking this SOA practices further that what all that you can give as a SOA consultant. So I just want to share one experience with you. Uh, I wanted to uh, have this discussion at the start of this meeting. The sole purpose of this content is uh, for this seven day session is for a variety of audience. So this session can be for project managers to whom uh, my audience, uh, they could be people who are, who are working as project managers or they are people who could be working as developers or senior developers or they could be people who are working as business analysts or they could be people who are working as solution architects or enterprise architects or technical architects. So this session will actually help any one of you to leverage and envisage your capabilities in the SOA world. So, so in SOA, they are SOA architects and for project managers, uh, the overall purpose and intent of this session is that uh, any project manager who is attending this session uh, would be able to handle the SOA projects effectively uh, in terms of execution and estimation and the challenges and the overall aim and intention is that to make the audience aware of all the SOA practices and uh, the rest, uh, the development of REST web services and different aspects of SOAP services and REST web services and all, all about that. 